Heather, Jen, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to this conversation. This is the first time I've done a show with two people, so you'll have to go easy on me. Let's start by uh, getting some introductions. So maybe you can each introduce yourself and then would love to hear the story behind Alliance Global Advisors and what led you to to go off on your own and start the firm. Excellent. So I'll start with introductions. My name is Jennifer Stevens. Um, together, Heather Border and I are co-founders and managing partners of Alliance Global Advisors. Just a little bit about my background. Um, prior to launching Alliance in April of 2020, um, I spent about 16 years with a firm called the Townsend Group, um, one of the largest real asset consulting firms in the world. Um, I began my career in Townsend's Cleveland office, overseeing a number of advisory and at the time discretionary clients of the firm. And in 2008, I was asked to move out to uh, California to co-manage the, the San Francisco office where I became the primary consultant to many of Townsend's West Coast uh, clientele. Um, in addition to serving as a, a lead consultant for many of the clients of the firm, I also sat on Townsend's advisory investment committee and I led ESG practices for the organization. And I was a partner of the firm um, through their latest four transactions. So have a little bit of a, um, a perspective in ESG, a broad perspective on the LP universe, and a very wide perspective on global institutional investment managers. So I'll turn it over to Heather. Yeah, thanks. So Jen and I actually met at the Townsend Group. Um, I started my uh, institutional career there. Uh, prior to joining Townsend Group, I was in finance and banking uh, in Naples, Florida, and then moved out to Denver, Colorado, and was in the Denver office for the Townsend Group for about six and a half years. Um, Post-global financial crisis, um, I decided to gear my career more towards the capital raising uh, piece of the industry um, and went on to raise capital for a variety of firms. Uh, but my most recent firm was a firm in Washington, D.C. called National Real Estate Advisors. Um, Post-National Real Estate Advisors, um, Jen and I decided to launch Alliance Global Advisors, and that launch date was actually April 1st, 2020. Uh, so we are coming up on our three years. Uh, we're still standing, so here we are today. <laughs> um, we have been fortunate just to bring on an exceptional team um, over the past three years. Uh, but really the foundation and the reason um, of Alliance Global Advisors being formage, for, for, formated was that you know, we were really just looking to service the industry in a way that the investment managers haven't been serviced in the past. And so Jen and I had several conversations throughout our careers, um, both at Townsend Group and when we went on to other organizations or when I went on to other organizations, um, about the void that we saw in the marketplace. And what we felt is there was a lot of resources available for the investors, um, a lot of diversification and resources available to the consulting world. Um, but when it came to the investment management world, there wasn't a true independent third-party voice um, that the investment managers could call on and ask questions um, and have their, have their strategy challenged and um, ways in which they were going about their organization. Um, and so that's really kind of the basis and the background of why we created Alliance. Um, I think throughout our careers, Jen and I were organically uh, providing that information and kind of those thoughts to our friends and families in the industry. Uh, so we just decided to basically institutionalize the concept. Awesome. Well, you both have a tremendous amount of experience in the industry, and I'm excited to dig in and, and get your thoughts. You know, before we do that, you talked about um, some of the services that you provide, or you didn't talk about, but let's talk about some of the services that you provide that give the GPs that independent voice. So kind of what is a what is a typical client relationship for Alliance Global look like? And what is kind of the span of, you know, scope that you all will work on with GPs? I'll cover that. Um, so Alliance Global Advisors is an independent advisory firm. Um, we're not out uh, in the market placing capital. Um, we're not serving as a broker in the market. And our client base is comprised of uh, global real asset investment managers, predominantly in the field of real estate. And these investors are both large and small. So when we launched the business, I think both Heather and I felt like our model would have a really big impact on emerging managers with less than 2 billion in assets under management, 
um, that might have had a diverse component um, or owners, operators that wanted to launch into the institutional fund business, but yet hadn't uh, been in front of an investor or a consultant or been through that due diligence process with those groups. So today um, in our advisory practice, I would narrow it down to really five pillars that we focus on. Um, the first is organizational analysis and working with executives and independent boards of directors on shaping strategic planning initiatives for the firm. So this might mean assessing the composition of the workforce or the existing organization, helping an investment manager to determine where they want to be in three, five, 10 years, evaluating their infrastructure to make sure it's appropriately positioned and taking them through a, a strategic planning exercise on what they need to accomplish to satisfy investors um, during these this phase of growth. So um, really we're serving as a, a growth advisor to investment managers that want to change their organizations or compete um, for capital that they haven't yet accessed. Um, in addition to that organizational analysis, the second pillar of what we're doing um, really tails on that and that is new product development. So we are helping the investment managers we advise to understand um, the appetite of the existing investor and consultant community at different phases of the market cycle. Um, once they have a clear understanding of the appetite of investors, really matching their expertise and their performance track record with an applicable strategy that they can put forward to market. Um, and that involves making sure they understand the competitive universe in which they play. As Heather mentioned, as consultants, you kind of sit in this position of privilege. You have access to so much information. You're sifting through research and all of that information to determine the best fit for your clients. What we try to do at Alliance Global Advisors is bring that competitive set uh, perspective and the perspective on the markets forward to better shape institutional products for the ultimate investors. Um, alongside that competitive set analysis, we need to make sure that the managers we're working with are putting out terms and conditions in the market um, that are considered market rate, um, and that they understand where some of those items may, may be negotiated over time. Um, we're also helping them to put research in place and work with third parties or their internal research teams to really develop their thesis and put some, some support um, behind the thesis that they're putting out in market and really helping them to design a product that suits the needs of institutional investors. Um, so that second pillar, that new product development pillar is one that I get really excited about. Um, and I know Heather will elaborate a little bit more on the third pillar, which is more marketing and brand elevation based on her experience. But once we have the design of that product, how do we take it to market and make sure that the first time an investment manager is sitting in front of a consultant or investor, it's not the first time they've heard of the organization or the strategy. And so we work with some of the leading associations around the world to put our clients out front on panels, in webinars, um, in print, um, to make sure that they're aware of the audience that they're targeting, they understand the DNA of that audience, and that they're really um, helping to shape a diversified investor base for the product that they're launching. Um, the fourth pillar is related to professional development, so really helping to expand and train an existing team of people up to be client-facing, um, making sure that everybody in the organization is speaking the same language, understands the genesis of due diligence requests that may come uh, from the investors, so on and so forth. And the fifth pillar is one that's really important to our organization, and that's what I refer to, and, and we refer to at Alliance as the Alliance Gives Back program. And that's putting thought leadership forward in the industry um, that serves both the investors um, and the investment managers that we're advising. So we spend a lot of time on that Give Back initiative um, and try to educate the market in a way that um, is really needed. So Heather, what did I miss on the on on that explanation of services? Not so much missing. Um, very comprehensive. I think the other piece that I would add is, you know, although you know a majority of our our clients are focused on growth solutions, um, it's truly also a, re a, re a refinement as well. So, um, you know, if you talk about kind of the cons consistencies among our client base, and our our client base is very diverse in nature. Um, it represents a total of about five hundred billion AUM to date, um, and what that shows is that it's 
it's the smaller managers, it's mid-sized managers, and it's the very large global managers in nature um, that really want to do best by the investor base. Um, our tagline is our best, the best performing partner. Um, and we really do bring that to light when it comes to servicing our clients with the intent of our clients being able to service the investor capacity in a much more meaningful and intentional manner. Um, so as Jen mentioned, it can kind of be an org organizational refinement. It can be all items investor facing refinement. Um, we'll talk about ESG and DNI focus points when it comes to um, sometimes just an implementation plan. Plan, but also refinement upon the entire organization as we truly believe that those elements need to be integrated throughout the entire organization. Um, and I think that really what it comes down to is positioning themselves to become a better version of themselves prior to the start of the alliance engagement and be really confident in what they're, with what they're bringing to the marketplace. Thank you. That's super comprehensive. And I think there's a lot to unpack. I think one of the reasons it sounds like that you started Alliance is to help the industry evolve and change. I mean, I'm curious to know over the course of your career or even over the course of the last you know, three to five years, what are some of the shifts or what are some of the changes that you've observed kind of in the industry that managers should be paying attention to, but maybe aren't fully focused on yet, but, but, you know, it's coming. Do you have a sense of kind of what the current themes are in terms of what you're seeing across your client base today? I mean, one element that I've seen a major shift in over the past three years is just the element of communication, right? I mean, think of GFC and how that unfolded and was was unfolding and the lack of communication that the investment managers brought to the community. So I think seeing a huge shift just in communication in general um, has been very gratifying um, to me, at least coming from a, a marketing and capital raising background, as well as a consulting background. Um, I think that element continues to need to increase and improve. Um, I think through communication and through increase in transparency um, and data collection and et cetera, and we can kind of talk about some of those elements as well. Uh, but just like overall, I think that increase in, in communi communications has been really evident in our market, um, especially as we saw the pandemic unfold. Um, and you, you kind of saw the managers go to work as far as what was happening on the asset level um, very quickly. Um, we're now seeing... Um, you know, a bit of change in history in the, in the banking environment. Um, and you're seeing transparency um, come in very forthcoming messaging from the managers um, that they will need to continue as well. So I think that transparency is one element that will continue to need to increase, but we've seen a major shift in the past, you know, 10 years, call it. I think that that level of transparency that's required of the investors and their consultants is what has also shaped this trend line in ESG reporting, um, which is um, a trend that's here to stay, but it's really centered around transparency and data and making sure investors have access to information at the property level and portfolio level that may increase um, the perceived risk of their properties in the future. So ESG is another trend that I just wanted to point out. I also wanted to point out two other kind of on the ground trends that we're witnessing today. Um, that's the expansion. One of them is the expansion of the universe of subtypes. Um, so we used to only focus on the four major property types, office, industrial, multifamily, and retail. And as everybody knows now, there's been the emergence of all of these subtypes and specialty property types that are really gaining traction amongst the institutional investor community and changing the portfolio makeup and what it takes to create alpha. So that shift from four major property types to acceptance of historically non-institutionalized property types is really changing the level of advice that's needed for some of those operators that have served that niche in the past but have yet to offer products to investors. Um, and then finally, um, one thing that I've observed over the last five years, which has been surprising to me, is just the acceptance and desire for changing structures and different vehicle types in, um, in real estate. So it used to be only separate accounts and only commingled funds. Now there's such a desire for special situations, transactions, that creating a really unique 
product or the market, it takes a certain um, it takes a certain level of understanding of how to make it work for the underlying investors or the investors in some cases in prior vehicles. Um, and really to launch something that's compelling to the market that might look a little bit more like a programmatic joint venture, a secondaries transaction, a GP-led recapitalization. Um, all of these items um, are creating further complexity in the real estate universe and really impacting sort of the trend lines on the ground and what we're seeing in terms of new product design. The other piece is that with that complexity, you're seeing a lot more competition, right? So um, it wasn't that long ago that re-ups were, you know, almost assumed that they would occur. And while 2021 and 2022 um, essentially was the year of the re-ups, um, it became a lot more competitive in nature, right? And now you're seeing as we're, we're going into 2023, um, the larger allocators um, that have, you know, the longer track records um, are now competing against the more niche, um, very much focused sharpshooter operating models, um, whereas that wasn't a space they had to compete against before. Um, so I think, you know, with all the, you know, transformation in our industry, um, the complexity, as Jen mentioned, uh, we're also becoming a lot more competitive, um, which once again is, you know, why our clients tend to work with us. Yeah, let's talk about competition. I think it's interesting because, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is, you know, this emergence of new sectors, uh, kind of more niche sectors, if you will. You've mentioned the emergence of new capital strategies and capital structures, and you know you hear a lot about this need for diversification allocators and their consultants are looking for diversification yet if you look at the numbers and you look at the b reits of the world and the s reits of the world there continues to be um, kind of a flight to the largest most institutional managers and so your universe uh, includes those groups, but it also includes people who are looking to get into, you know, the institutional real estate world for the first time. How do you help advise them to kind of cut through the noise and, you know, develop a product, develop a solution that is attractive, knowing that, you know, the inertia effectively is against you. I mean, the absolute kind of number of people trying to get institutional capital compared to the number of people who are successful in raising institutional capital. I mean, it's a very, very small fraction. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I'm really glad you brought up the non-traded REIT space. It's a space that we've spent uh, quite a bit of time learning about um, and advising our clients on. Um, it's also an alternative capital source, right? And a really big influence on the transaction markets. So our managers are selling to some of the non-traded REITs um, that, might be, that might have a different cost of capital. Um, or be willing to take on a slightly lower return profile um, to meet the needs of their underlying investors. And by the way, the underlying investors that make up these vehicles is also transforming. It's not just the large state pension plans that are leading this institutional investment world anymore. There are so many multi-managers that we're tracking. Um, so managers that sponsor primary fund vehicles, but also have captive pools of capital to invest in third-party vehicles or different types of special situations. Um, we're tracking the high net worth space, the RIA channel. Um, these are all forces in capital that influence the way our managers are buying and selling assets and the type of capital that they're trying to attract for a product that they may need to restructure to allow for that capital. So we first saw that trend in the sovereign wealth funds entering the entering the markets in a bigger force. But now that um, that capital uh, formation is, is so much different. Um, to, to get to your question, Brandon, just about the, you know, how are we advising managers when all of this is changing so rapidly? Really just trying to make them aware of these new capital sources, doing a lot of research on how to approach the capital sources, understanding who within each organization covers what product type, what type of vehicle, to make sure that when managers are reaching out to these capital sources, they're talking to the right people and they're not kind of getting shuffled into um, you know, a system or a database that's not actively looking at those strategies. So that's one way we're advising them. Um, I also think it's really important to be creative. Um, there are ways of capturing some of these trends in a large allocator vehicle. Some organizations have done it really well by bringing on underlying 
um, operators and different property types that they think will excel. Um, and there's also a learning curve for those operators to become more institutional and meet the reporting best practice guidance that has been set by some of those other parties and fiduciaries. So we're we're advising managers in a number of ways, but I think the 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 best way to summarize it is that we think you need to be creative to raise capital today. There needs to be some type of incentive, right? You need to be either the top performing operator in your property type. That's one differentiator. Um, you need to offer something compelling from a financial or an economic perspective to the capital source. So is it possible to create a co-GP vehicle? Is it possible to give um, economics that would result in fee neutral exposure to the underlying investor? Is it possible to grow this new and creative platform with a, um, a strategic partner at the helm that is then compensated for their participation in the growth? So it needs to be something unique and exciting to really gain traction. But let's not forget there's also a need for creating a very well diversified heel in the water position within a real estate portfolio that will still include exposure to large diversified funds. And so I think people are kind of playing the alpha component in non-core, in some of these specialty property types to get the additional return that's required. But there is still absolutely a need for the traditional vehicles. And some of those need to be restructured, which is another way we're helping managers today. Yeah, and I think to encourage that creativity piece that Jen brought up, it's, it's kind of we go backwards a bit and we start by way of education. So when we were laying down the foundation and the, and the formation for how we would service our clients, um, you know, I would always bring to the forefront of my experience having go from the consulting world to the investment management world is that I was very much surprised that the, some of the investment management senior uh, leaders truly didn't understand the needs or the objectives of the investors or how the LPs um, and the consultants uh, and the board and decisions were being made, um, just kind of the, the intricacies of it all. Um, and so that by way of education, as, as Jen had kind of spoken to, um, is how we've really kind of backtracked and try to lay the foundation with our clients. So as we're integrated in the industry, we try to educate on different themes that are occurring today and themes that we are seeing down the pipeline but then also very much focus on where we think the investor expectations are heading. Um, we try to educate our clients on why the consultants are asking the questions that they're asking, what they're doing with the information that we're providing, and how better kind of service the, consultant, the consulting world as well and their, their own internal processes and their own internal challenges. So it sounds like there's, you know, a lot of changes underway, including the actual underlying composition of the structure including the underlying types of LPs from your traditional institutional public pension plans to, you mentioned the sovereign wealth funds. Now we're looking at non-traded REITs, which have really taken a significant inflow from the RIAs, the, you know, ultra high net worth and high net worth investors. You know, this can be, you know, head spinning for some, right? I mean, it used to be, you know, I'm an institutional manager. I've got a coverage team. I go out and raise capital from pension plans across the country or Taft Hartley or, you know, whatever it may be. So it, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the investment manager of the future looks like what? I mean, how do you how do you kind of describe this changing landscape as you're working with GPs and they're trying to think about how to set up and future-proof their business? Because it seems a lot more multifaceted today than it was even a decade ago with the emergence of new capital sources, new structures, new macro environment, et cetera. Yeah, I'll kind of speak broadly and, and I'm sure Jen can add some more specifics, but I think the it has to be ever evolving. And that is where our industry has been changing and moving. Um, you know, not to speak negatively on our industry, but it has been more of a dinosaur approach and a very much slow and a little bit resist, I'm gonna say very resistant to change and evolution. So um, to me, the, the manager that survives um, and the manager that thrives um, is obviously extremely transparent, um, is invested in data, like we've never seen data before. So Brandon, I would appreciate your comments on, on that as well. Um, the technology implementation is going to be critical. You know, um, Brandon, I remember we were at a conference and you made a comment that technology and real estate used to be completely bifurcated, whereas now as an industry for the first time ever, we're looking at it as a holistic approach. 
Um, I think that's going to be critical for our industry. Um, but that that constant evolution and that need to change and want to do better, I think that really sets the tone for the manager that survives and, and thrives. But Jen, feel free to, to add to that comment. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. So I think future-proofing, Brandon, and, and Heather kind of tagging along on what you said. So first of all, I really believe at my core that performance is the best differentiator for any investment manager out there. So sticking to what you're doing, being mindful of the investments you're making, the cost to buy an asset, how you can um, improve the quality of the asset to sell, or, sell it for a higher price to a different capital source, you know, that's at the heart of what we do. So just being mindful of the level of attentiveness it takes at the operations level and the investment level so you don't miss something, right? So performance to me is the best differentiator on future-proofing an organization. But there are ways to um, grow a business very thoughtfully to increase enterprise value for the firm, right? So many sharpshooters um, or those that are really experienced and have strong performance in a fund series or a separate account series or their own individual balance sheet are um, really focused on creating one exceptional product. Typically, that product is looks like a closed-end commingled vehicle in the non-core space, so might be taking on a little bit of risk, repositioning an asset, releasing it to market at a higher price, as I mentioned, and really focused on that re building a realized track record in that segment of the market. So stick to the, stick to your knitting, do what you do well, and grow your organization by including tangential vehicles that are related to that strategy. So if you have a non-core vehicle, sponsor a core separate account or a programmatic joint venture to capture more of the deal flow your teams might be seeing in a, on, at the stabilized level. Um, build an open-end fund over the years, not immediately, as we've seen many managers try to do recently, um, but really strategically position that program for longevity and building enterprise value of the firm. And then within that non-core bucket, you know, try to think outside the box. Can you build a, um, a vertical, um, say you're an industrial manager, can you build a vertical in cold storage or manufacturing that would really serve a market or an area where your team will be considered the expert because it hasn't been institutionalized yet? So, um, and then finally, we are doing a lot of work with investment managers that are considering M&A activity. Um, so I think your question has a lot of um, moving parts to it, how to future-proof an organization. I think focusing on what you do well and really increasing, enhancing the performance, try to sell portfolios, don't just accumulate assets, create that realized track record, and then build on from there um, in terms of related experience, I think is how you... Um, stand the test of time and where others have done really incredible things with their growth. Um, there have been some missteps by managers that have grown too quickly. Um, there have also been um, some really incredible investment opportunities that come out of managers that are focused on growth and innovation. The only other piece that I'd add is that I think it's going to be really critical for those managers to be able to articulate where they're adding the value, right? So we're in an exceptional time period where it's going to be very clear of who's been riding the wave um, and really who the standout managers are um, through kind of this test of time, if you will. Um, but then also to be able to, you know, articulate in a very cohesive way to the investors and the consultant community on where your team is truly adding the value, uh, especially, you know, from the bifurcation of this market. Yeah, I think I, I would I would echo that. I mean, uh, we we have a lot of customers who are uh, incredible investment managers, but one thing uh, is consistent across all the conversations is everybody is uh, uniquely different. Uh, and by being uniquely different, everybody is mostly uniquely the same. And so I think, Jen, going back to your point about, you know, performance is the best indicator you know, I totally agree that, you know, there's nothing that will trump exceptional performance, but a caveat is oftentimes people think that they can hide behind their performance and not have to be transparent. And ultimately, you know, what we see, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts, is that you have to have not just, you know, Heather, going back to what you said, it's no longer tech and real estate, it's real estate. And to be a real estate investment net manager, you, you need to use technology. And the same could hold true potentially for performance. It's no longer that exceptional performance will allow you to be opaque. It's transparency 
and performance are essential. It's not one or the other. And I think there's still some work that needs to be done to get our industry to understand that. But I'm, you know, I'm curious to know from your perspective, when the LPs reward performance over all else, what's the stick that, you know, what's the stick that drives that change? Because ultimately a lot of managers, you know, there's always going to be the managers that are early adopters and they want to go first because they do the right thing. But a lot of people see going first as being very risky. So how do you get the industry to evolve and kind of adopt this change towards being more transparent, towards being, uh, having better communication with their LPs? Yeah. Uh, um, I'll start here because I think that's a, a really valid point that performance is not everything. Um, it, it really isn't. Um, so one thing I failed to mention in other commentary is also the importance of creating a global distribution platform by leveraging third party service providers or building something in house that can reach and retain your investor base and attract new investors to your, your program. So I think that building that global distribution mindset is something where we've seen really high performers miss the mark, right? So we might be working with an operator that has exceptional top quartile performance in their area of expertise that has never went out beyond their two strategic partners that they work with and they've worked with since vehicle one or fund one. Those investors have rewarded them for performance time and time again, but there will be a time when that reward doesn't come through due to denominator effect or due to a new CIO at the program level. So one area of emphasis that we try to, um, that we try to instill in our managers is the importance of diversifying your investor base. And to do that um, efficiently, you need to have the right global distribution efforts in place. And then also, Brandon, there is a need for, um, and an interest, a really strong interest in working with new managers um, that might be considered emerging managers that are doing something innovative or building an organization because those managers that are smaller and nimble and um, and really thoughtful and have a, a historical track record to build on within their own organizations, there's a lot of alpha to be generated by those managers that may not be available elsewhere if you're just kind of competing with broker deals all over the place, right? So, um, so I think the emerging manager space is one that will continue. There's a need for it um, to create more innovation in our industry and kind of move the needle forward. Um, and that's one way of kind of also taking that, you know, performance that you may have built elsewhere and, and bringing it to the next level. I guess the other piece that I'd add is that, um, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to challenge your service providers. So we talked a kind of a little bit about the evolution of our industry and how, you know, how it's changed and how it's transformed. You know, we're leaning on service providers, you know, more than we ever have in the past. Um, and I think historically, you know, we've brought in service providers, um, less them in place, not done a great job of articulating to our client base um, and the investor and LP base on how we're really using those service providers and how they truly are integrated with our internal team members. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to not only challenge our service providers, but to continue to clearly articulate the objectives um, and pushing them along and to truly understand kind of the competitive set on how your peer group is using their, their service providers as well. Can you, can you give an example? I think, you know, you, you're, I, I want to go back to something that you were talking about, Jen, but before I do, you know, Heather, I mean, you're talking about service providers and, and I, I agree that, you know, our role as a uh, participant in the ecosystem, I prefer the word partner, but service provider also works. I just don't like vendor, but you can call me whatever you want, I guess, at the end of the day, you know, our job is to be, you know, a, a partner. It's to help you be better. And in order to be better, the onus is on us to stay ahead of the curve, to be able to provide you with guidance and it's your job to be able to push us, right? So what is an example of how you've seen this relationship between, you know, one of your clients, a GP or their service provider evolve? Or what would you, you know, if you haven't seen it happen yet, what would you like to see happen um, to kind of, you know, put a, you know, put, put a put a dot on that point? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I think there's a couple of different ways. I mean, I think it's it's becoming very clear um, in the ESG and DEI world and the evolution of that piece of our industry is um, the way that in which that I've seen um, that piece evolve um, and where that it, it seems to work 
is when the client's able to articulate the specific service of that partner and how that they join forces with the overall team. Um, and I think that that hasn't been done very well in the past. So I bring ESG and DE to light because um, there's those providers that help um, or, or partners um, that help bring kind of the plan to place that that help you understand and educate you on where the market is and where the he- and where it's headed. And there's a completely set of partners, different set of partners that are, um, you know, uh, articulating the data and data collection efforts. Um, and then setting very specific KPIs going forward. So I think that what I'm, I think what I'm trying to articulate here is that just to be able to clearly provide the objectives of that service provider, um, then push that service provider and, and partner forward um, to truly provide a difference to the investor and be able to articulate it to the entire team of partners and internal on how you how you see that provider adding value going forward. Brandon, um, it kind of reminds me of the uh, my days as a consultant, right? Which is a um, effectively a service provider for institutions that want to have a better and more um, in depth knowledge of the real estate universe to make informed decisions. So think about your space um, at Juniper Square. You know who's the expert in implementing a technology platform and database that leverages data and also provides a distribution to investors, right? You are the expert. So investors can try to build that internally or they can leverage the expertise and lessons learned of organizations whose sole focus it is to improve and perfect that specific act. So, um, you know, taking me back to my Townsend days, I always felt like, you know, consultants can be viewed as a scapegoat. They can be viewed as the fiduciary in the room, the independent party in the room. But really, they are a team of, you know, at Townsend, it was over 100 people that invested in real estate. And everything we did all day long was related to real estate investment. And we're working alongside one um, one staff member that needs to boil down all of these critical global factors to, and report up to, you know, his or her C, you, CIO. So leveraging expertise of others is not um, is not a is something to be embarrassed about. It actually makes for better investors. We're seeing it, as Heather mentioned, in ESG. We're tracking um, a database of service providers, technology providers, and not only ESG, DEI, and now climate. Um, we're seeing it in research. Um, and outsource CIO functionality. Um, we're seeing it in marketing um, through the use of placement agents or third-party marketers to broker a specific deal, not necessarily a fund. So the use of experts that know their specific space really well can be something that an investment management organization could leverage to grow in a really thoughtful and productive way over time. Yeah, I would add that we're seeing it through the lens of outsourced fund uh, administration and deal servicing as well, where, you know, GPs are finding a lot of leverage by using third parties like Juniper Square and others to actually do the fund accounting and investor reporting for them so that they can focus on their expertise, which is, you know, going out and generating alpha and finding the best deals and creating the right structures that are going to be interesting for them, you know, for their investors and, and uh, you know, help them outperform their peers going forward. So we agree with that completely. We um, we have a few more minutes, and I want to I want to switch topics over to ESG. I know it's an area of um, of of passion and deep expertise where you've uh, kind of been an industry leader in terms of helping to educate both sides of the market, the GP and the LP. Yet, despite kind of everybody's best efforts, I think there's still a tremendous amount of confusion and disagreement. Uh, as much as I hate to acknowledge it, around the importance of ESG. I guess, you know, for both of you through your lens, you know, having uh, uh, a lot of expertise on the allocator side as a consultant and working with LPs and now advising the GP community, maybe share with us what your position is with respect to ESG. And then we can kind of unpack a few of the different trends that we're seeing uh, through throughout the industry. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Heather kind of comment on this. But first, I just want to kind of pose one question to the audience or the listeners or you, Brandon. You know, the question is this, if there were a piece of information or data related to your property 
that you could improve to enhance income at the property level or potentially the value upon exit? Would it be a piece of information or data that your team would want to have a better understanding of how to assess it, perfect it, improve it, and produce a better outcome for investors? That's my question because I think it's a data question. It's not a you know, we get so wrapped up in policy and procedures because policies and procedures keep us on track in ESG and they keep the accountability present. But what it's really about is optimizing efficiency at the asset level. And there are certain measurements that you can track and you need to be tracking as a firm in order to improve the possible outcome and mitigate downside risk for investors. So I, I think we do ourselves a disservice at times by politicizing ESG when, to me, if we just focused on the measurable aspects and the data, this would the answer to your question would really come to light. It really would. And that's what we're starting to see show in the data. So Heather, on the advisory front, maybe worthwhile to talk about what we're doing um, with our managers that are focused on ESG, and it's not the only thing we're doing. Yeah, um, rather than get in kind of the nuances on how we're assisting all of our managers, I would say that the one piece um, of advice that I would bring to this conversation um, is to really just be as transparent as possible as your intentions around the space. Um, that's really what investors are looking for. Um, you know, as an industry, I think we're doing um, a much better job from a consistent reporting standpoint than we have in the past. Um, clearly, to Brandon's point, um, we have a long runway to go um, in that regards. Um, but so many times I see a manager um, that is fearful of bringing to light, um, you know, where where they stand on their ESG and DEI journey. Um, and when you get, you know, feedback from the investor and consultant community, that's really what they're looking for. Just be forthcoming of where you are today, where you're headed, um, your plan to allocate resources going forward, um, and make sure that you're, you're performing a consistent message across your organization and the, the internal organization understands your objectives as well. Yeah, I've, I've heard the same thing from investors and consultants, which is, you know, don't, don't try to you know, engage in greenwashing. Don't try to pretend that you're something that you're not. Just show up, be authentic, talk about where you are. If you're not where they want you to be and you have an intention to get there, acknowledge it. But, you know, understanding where everybody's coming from as a starting point is critical. Um, I don't want to, you know, rabbit hole on kind of the political politicization of, uh, of ESG, but it, it's real and you have some, you know, state, uh, you know, states that are advising or mandating that they're, you know, uh, 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 different, you know, what we would call LPs, you know, pension pensions, uh, avoid investing in firms that are participating in, you know, ESG focused funds. I mean, what is your advice to either, you know, uh, the, the government officials and, or, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the GPs who are trying to talk to those organizations, because the reality is, you know, we can sit here and say, you know, just be honest, be real, take the feedback. But the feedback is vastly inconsistent. You've got European LPs who are telling you they won't look at you unless you meet a very high bar. You've got some North Americans telling you they care, but they're not really backing it up with their dollars because they're still putting money to work with managers who aren't investing in ESG. And then you're, and then you have some that care and are only investing with ESG you know, managers who meet a minimum threshold. And then you have some that are saying, this is all bogus. Like if you do it, I'm not going to invest with you, period. It's, it's all political. So, I mean, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it or oversimplify it, but I, I think suffice to say, it's really confusing um, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you sit on. So any, any thoughts or reactions to that? Cause I think that represents the, the real world on the ground today, despite. Yeah, you're right. Um, and I'm not going to take that bait to advise political officials on what they should or should not be doing. But what I do think is relevant is that, you know, every investor is a beautiful and unique snowflake, right? Every investor has different portfolio needs in ESG, in property type exposure, in geographical exposure, um, the types of managers they prefer and the vehicles that um, their managers institute. So every, every investor has a different point of view on everything, not just ESG. Um, 
And what I would say um, to the investment managers out there that are beginning their journey is that even in more difficult property types, some of your competitors are able, let's just take multifamily, for example. We work with a few multifamily operators who are able to collect utility bill data for every single one of their properties going back into history using Energy Star's portfolio manager tool, which is free. Okay, so if you're an operator that hasn't even thought about that or don't think it's you don't think it's possible, just consider who you're competing against that has that data. You know, how they're using that data will shape the outcome of their performance and um, their viewpoint on how to incorporate ESG. But just put yourself in a situation where you're competing with a group of eight or 10 operators who have the data and you do not. So our advice is to collect the data, energy, um, energy, water, waste, climate, uh, greenhouse gas, carbon, collect that data, right? It's, you know, it's critical to um, competition. And then for the rest, just consider that every investor is different and your research on that investor's preferences prior to a meeting is paramount, which is something we try to also inform our managers about before they're sitting in front of a prospect. Heather? Agreed. Can I just throw ourselves under the bus? No, <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's perfect and a really nice way to kind of... Um, you know, conclude this episode. And I think that that researching of investors just from my capital raising days, is that something that, you know, we could always improve upon. Um, and so I would encourage anybody that has a meeting with an upcoming investor or consultant, um, try to find as much, uh, you know, out about that investor, their objectives, the history of their investment um, decision making, um, you know, where the authority lies, the process that's going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, our industry is a little bit different than others. Is there's a lot of uh, public information. There's a lot of research available out there. Um, and Alliance Global Advisors is always here to help as well. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. And, and like you said, a great place to wrap up. I know that um, we've covered a, we've covered a lot of ground. And I think, you know, a few of the takeaways for me in this episode is that you know real estate is ever changing and in order to you know stay ahead or stay relevant you have to be creative you have to focus on performance data is your friend technology is your friend uh, and transparency matters a lot and gone are the days where you can choose performance over transparency or real estate or technology. All of these things are becoming intermixed, which means that the role of a real estate GP is becoming more important, but also more challenging, especially if you don't like to evolve, which really uh, I think speaks to the role that Alliance Global Advisors plays in the ecosystem, which is, you know, helping GPs navigate these challenging times, knowing that, you know, the world is not static. Our our industry is not static and we're evolving and that evolution is fun, um, but it just requires work and it requires partnership. So, you know, I appreciate everything that you both have done for the industry. It's been incredible to watch your progress over the last three years as you know you launched the firm and have absolutely come on to the scene with a bang uh you both were individually well known but the work that you've done with alliance is is really impressive and uh doing a lot to move the industry forward so thank you both for your time and for joining me today it's been great to uh to chat with you in this forum thank you, thank so, you much. so much